Let's take a good hard look as to why everyone seems to be quitting the keto diet. Is everyone quitting keto? What went wrong? I'm Dr. Eric Westman and welcome back to another Dr. Westman Reacts. If you don't have my top 10 tips on how to start keto the right way, check in the description below. I was sent this video by Tom and if you don't know that name, Tom DeLauer has been a very influential YouTube influencer on the keto diet, has uh, sold things does as an entrepreneur and a personal trainer. I couldn't find information of whether he went to college or, or but again, he has the street cred, the, the clinical experience of being a personal trainer for lots of different people and probably got onto keto because it's so, so helpful when you're training and, uh, and used it to, to his own advantage as well. But so what is the evidence that people are quitting keto? I, I actually see more people starting a keto diet. I suppose it's how, how you define it. In what space are we talking? His world is a personal trainer, is a YouTube world. My world is a clinical program and seeing keto products come out on the shelves. And so it may be a different, uh, different situation, a selection bias, but let's see what he's thinking. Let's take a good hard look as to why everyone seems to be quitting the keto diet. Seems like everywhere you turn, someone is abandoning it or no longer doing it or cycling it instead of doing it as a lifestyle now, which I don't see as necessarily a bad thing, but I wanted to reverse engineer what's gone on in the last couple of years. Why are people pivoting? What's changed? Now, I would say that I've changed, but in reality, like I've cycled on and off of a ketogenic diet for the better part of five years. So I've always touted the benefits of coming on and off so that you get various benefits in both categories, but that's neither here nor there. I really wanted to address why so many people are just shouting this from the rooftops. And I think the first one that we should really address is people probably embarked for the wrong reasons. They probably did it as a, you know, lose weight quick kind of thing, or maybe social media influenced them to do it, or maybe it was the appeal of certain foods. Uh, I definitely talked to a lot of people that were interested in going keto because it felt like they could eat foods that were taboo for a really long time. So they were able to eat uh, cheeses, they were able to eat these higher fat things, butter. My sister is a perfect example. She went on a ketogenic diet as a triathlete, as a mountaineer, and she really enjoyed her performance. But she started to notice some things she didn't like, but one of the things that she mentioned that she's going to stick with, even though she's not doing it anymore, is she noticed that she no longer has phobias of cheeses or phobias of butter and things like that. So I'm like, you know what, that's a win. I didn't know there were, was a term for fear of butter or, or fear of, 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 I know fear of fats. Uh, some people have trouble even starting eating fats again because they've been told not to eat them for so long. So um, I think the, a theme of this video is, is that Tom is in a world very different than my clinical world. So if you're one of my patients, the reason you probably went on a keto diet is not to win a marathon or, or uh, it's probably to reverse obesity, diabetes, some other metabolic issue. It might even be to get rid of migraine, headaches, heartburn, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, all of these different things. So the reason you're going on it has medical significance. In fact, most other doctors would give you a medication for it. So if you're doing it for these reasons, it's more likely that you're going to stick to it. The other interesting thing that he didn't mention but comes to my mind is that if you learn a system that's difficult, it's going to be harder to stick to it. So that the uh, uh, method that I teach is actually very simple, which makes it easier to do for a longer period of time. Like even though you're not doing this low carb thing anymore, you've learned that these certain fats aren't a problem, right? That you can have them. It's actually made her a more well-rounded person. But I think that allure got a lot of people in. And then just like anything, you try something for a while and you get used to it and it's the honeymoon period's over and it's not as great anymore. So that could have been a big reason. 
Now, I think that some of the 180s that people have done, where they almost seem anti-keto now, that could have been avoided by just utilizing keto as a tool in the toolbox from the get-go. Now, what I mean by that is just understanding that keto should be treated as a hormetic stressor, right? It's almost like throwing a weight vest on. Like sometimes it, it makes some things more difficult, it makes some things easier, but at the same time, it's training your body in a different medium. And you need to look at keto in that way rather than just adopting it as your forever lifestyle because maybe that's not realistic. So I don't quite understand that. I, I, I look at, uh, of course, I've been thinking about a keto diet and doing research on this now for over 25 years. I think a keto diet is probably one of the healthiest diets you can do in the long run. It's not uh, more of a stressor than any other kind of diet that you can do if you do it in a in a reasonable way with real foods, not adding in extra oils and worrying about uh, you know where the food comes from all the time, the super clean kind of concern that people have. So I, I don't see the diet as a stressor. I don't understand this one. Maybe it's not realistic for a human to never have a carb again, right? So if you adopt that mindset, then you feel like you're pigeonholed. You feel like you're trapped. You feel like you're restricted. And human beings can only feel restricted for so long before they just rebound, right? So that's my personal opinion on really the main reason. The next one is possibly a distrust in dogmatic behavior and dogmatic groups. A lot of times we as people like a little bit of tribalism because we like community, but we don't like dogmatic behavior. Okay, we get a little bit turned off by that. And when members of our own community are starting to sound extreme, we sort of have a social proof reflex to sort of avoid that, even if it's happening subconsciously. And I noticed that even happened with myself, whereas someone that was a big part of the keto community, when some people started getting so loud, and not to mention somewhat loud and inaccurate, it pushed me away. It made me think, maybe I don't want to be affiliated with this. I, I like it for my own reasons, but I don't necessarily want to be affiliated with this loud, partially incorrect group. When I say incorrect, I just mean twisting science or misunderstanding things. Well, so that's interesting. Again, thinking about Tom's background, if he hasn't gone through medical school or, or, or training in obesity medicine or and I'm past president of the Obesity Medicine Association, which is a group of thousands of doctors. I, I see that you can be a doctor and do things in different ways. I, I have, a, I guess, a, a bigger tolerance for being able to do things in different ways. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of cars, and there are a lot of different kinds of keto diets. So I don't know that there's one best way. And it may be that Tom's trying, like a lot of the influencers, to come up with the perfect diet. Uh, I don't, although he doesn't seem to have that uh, delusion that he'd be able to come up with the perfect diet like some, some influencers. And I don't think that we know the perfect diet uh, by any means. But so it could be that he's not aware that there are actually lots of different ways to be a doctor or a, a personal trainer and, or to teach diets. And, and just because someone else is using a keto diet, it doesn't mean that I have to embrace everything that other person is talking about. That's just from my experience with lots of different doctors having lots of uh, positive effects with their patients. So I think we've had a nature to just kind of say, maybe I, I step away from that, but I encourage people to find the reasons that you do it, not other people, because those other people should not scare you away from doing something that made you feel really, really good. Now the next one is one that's a little bit more physiological. And this is something that I've seen a lot of people encounter, and that is a micronutrient deficiency. Now what I mean by this is, if you are eating lower quality cuts of meat, lots of processed meat, lots of processed cheeses, things that by all means still fit the ketogenic macros, but you're not actually paying attention to food quality, it does not take long for a micronutrient deficiency to develop both from a mineral side of things and purely water-soluble and even some fat-soluble vitamins. Remember, on a lower carbohydrate diet, you lose more water because low levels of insulin allow you to excrete more. What ends up happening is you lose those water-soluble vitamins, and if you're not replenishing them 
and playing a really, really critical role in scrutinizing what goes in your mouth, you could end up in a bad spot. So I don't agree, I, I, but it may be a selection bias. It may be because my population that I teach uh, art has high functioning athletic. Uh, uh, remember, Tom's a personal trainer and may have a different sort of following that are that. And I remember Tom doing a long distance run on a different video, and, and he had a muscle cramp, and and that's where he's getting into trouble here with a cramp. So I have not seen micronutrient deficiencies using a clinical keto diet taught in the right way. You know, if he's talking about having salt and having potassium and magnesium. Absolutely. If you're uh, shifting and you're going to do a low-carb diet for a long period of time, you have to pay attention to get enough salt and enough magnesium. I usually don't throw that out at all at the first <laughs> visit because, you know, if you've been told not to eat fat and not to have salt and I say all these different things all at once, I usually unfold it slowly over time. But uh, any muscle cramp issue that comes on is a magnesium issue. You want to make sure you're having enough magnesium replacement. Milk and magnesia uh, is a great way to, an inexpensive way to get uh, magnesium. There are all sorts of other supplements that you could be using. Uh, but um, I, I don't see these micronutrient deficiencies and, and I don't see any data, you know, a study here from Tom, but he does have a lot of clinical experience, meaning with people that he has been a personal trainer with. I've always been a big fan of keeping high vegetable content in my diet, like keeping a high amount of cruciferous vegetables, trying to focus on getting things like some organ meat now and then so that I'm getting a lot of vitamins and minerals that I might be missing from some of the starchy vegetables and some of the starchy carbohydrates and fruit that I might not be having on a ketogenic diet. The, the language, again, it might not be getting. I, I, I need some evidence. I do also think that as much as it sounds cheesy because we all probably grew up in this era of like Sintram vitamins being pushed down our throat, right? Like you gotta take your multivitamin, it's the only way to be healthy. I think as a defense to that, we've sort of pushed away multivitamins, but the recent literature is demonstrating that multivitamins are quite strong. And especially on a lower carb protocol or just any diet in general, like a good multivitamin is quite powerful. Like it fills gaps. I think where people run into problems is they treat it as a crutch. No, it's there to fill gaps. You know, you ate well today, but maybe you're missing out on some thymine. Maybe you're missing out on B6, right? You need whatever. You take a multivitamin, you fill those gaps, and no harm, no foul. But a lot of the multivitamins have preservatives in them. They have weird things. They have sugar added to them. People are always asking the multivitamin that I recommend. I do take one, and this is the honest, very honest truth. I take one from Bomar Nutrition. It's three capsules a day, but it's got all kinds of interesting things in it. And one of the things I notice is even with their B12, they're using methylcobalamin. They're not using cyanocobalamin, which is like a cheap shortcut to vitamin B12. Bottom line is I put a link down below. Yes, they are a sponsor on this channel, but they sponsor this channel because I legitimately use their products, not the other way around. And that truly is the truth. I've met several vitamin manufacturers and presidents of, and or owners and um, they all think theirs is the best and uh, I've seen some even developed for low carb keto diets that uh, have a little bit of more of this a little bit less and, and that I am not really sure any of that's necessary as long as you're eating good real food. This next one is a very real thing. The online pressures. Dare I even say a little bit of bullying, right? And it's almost academic bullying. And I put myself up for scrutiny here by saying this, but whenever you talk about a low carb diet or keto, you immediately get blasted as a zealot, as a grifter, as someone that is anti-science, simply because it goes against the grain of normal conventional nutritional wisdom. But it doesn't mean that it's wrong. There's a lot of things that are more fringe, a lot of things, which by the way, keto is not fringe, a lot of things that are a little bit more narrow, that haven't gotten broad yet, that may look a little bit foreign and strange on the surface, but by no means should be bullied or teased or made to feel like a complete lunatic. I'm well, so that's interesting. I suppose as an influencer, he might be accused of being a grifter, to making money off of the products he sells. But in my experience, if, if you're 
my patient, it's, it's more like you're trying to do this in a family and you're trying to figure out how to feed the children and, or, or your, your mother comes with a pecan pie once a year and, and you're trying to figure out how to not have it or just have a taste of it. So the uh, very little, I don't feel or sense that there's the same level of, of bullying, at, at least among my patients, especially if you're saying, you know, I can't have that food because I have diabetes or I can't have, I'm eating this way because I'm reversing my diabetes and I'm losing weight and it's going great. You know, no one's going to interfere with that if you put, phrase it in the, those terms. Again, it's why are you doing it? If it's a medically significant sort of thing, then I, I hope your family and friends respect that. And being able to have a discussion about it, you may influence somebody who is actually initially negative toward you. Over time, those people can come around. In my experience, it's about six to 12 months when the husband or the wife watches and then starts to follow. It's not an immediate response. It might actually be negative at first. I'm sure if you've done keto, You've been called it all. You've been called dogmatic. You've been called a zealot. You've been called probably crazy. A lot of negative things. And sometimes you even get pushed into a corner where you just have to say, you know what, I'm not going to argue. I know what works for me. And this is where it can be tough. And I know a lot of people, a lot of influencers that were actually very esteemed, even academic influencers that said, you know what, I just am not going to talk about it anymore. This is the lifestyle I'm going to live, but I'm just not going to talk about it because all it does is open up a can of worms of negativity. So I think even though you might see people quitting keto or people talking about it less, I talk to a lot of people that still cycle in and out of it. They just don't publicly talk about it anymore because it's too much pressure. Like I understand, I get that. But what I want you to remember is that you're just finding your way and people can say whatever they want, but you got to do what works for you. And even though they may have negative things to say, you're just doing what's best for you and finding your way. And it's not with malicious intent. You're not trying to, you know, save the world. You're just trying to fix yourself. Well, and there's a big distinction in my experience of, of uh, being someone who's following a certain way of eating to fix yourself. And then you're not proselytizing or trying to get everyone else to eat your way. So there's a big difference between my uh, my view of the typical vegan approach, which is, to, which is to get everyone else to become vegan, and or a keto approach where really we're just trying to get healthy and trying to teach other people if they want. It's a, it's a, a different in a church kind of thing. It, it's a very different some religions you go out and you pound on the pavement on doors and and you spend a year going around trying to get converts and in other churches it's the the last thing you want to do is to try to get new converts and, and so anyway the if you're zealous about it because you're feeling so good i've seen that happen just you know tone it down you know, realize other people might not respond to you the way the the way that you're feeling and and just you know wait it out usually it's a matter of weeks to months before people will go oh you really have had good results and they'll follow the next one is really a misinterpretation of science like we're misinterpreting a lot of things and this has happened in the keto communities, but it's also happened throughout the internet. I'll just give you a perfect example. There were studies that have come out that have said, okay, well, the ketogenic diet or a low carb diet uh, will make you diabetic or will increase your or decrease your glucose tolerance. These are not accurate when they're twisted, right? Like people will take these studies and make huge claims online that scare people away from the ketogenic diet and actually get people to stop because they're saying, oh, I'm gonna make myself diabetic. When in reality, an increase in glucose on a ketogenic diet is entirely normal because you're reallocating glucose to the brain because the muscle cells don't need it as much. So glucose levels temporarily go up, but as soon as carbohydrates are cycled back in, which huge important point, they should be occasionally, glucose tolerance improves again. So and there's rodent model and human model data to support this. But what happens is science comes out and the science is nice and even keeled, but people grab it and they do what they want with it and they put their own title on it. And then there's all kinds of different mediums out there that look scientific, but they are not. And they give a scientific title that has completely distorted a perfectly even killed study. A lot of these studies, although some are funded by different organizations and that definitely exists, a lot of them are even keeled and they tone down their conclusions and their abstracts accordingly. 
It's just what we do with them on social media, and unfortunately, that's what the mainstream sees. So because of that sort of misinterpretation, people abandon keto. And I'm not saying they shouldn't. I'm saying that, hey, well, maybe you should listen to both sides of the equation and try to weigh in when you should do keto and when you should not. I want you to remember that when new literature comes out, and this channel is all about new literature, you need to learn to grow from the literature, grow from the science, not react. Because one study is not the end of the world, especially if it's a mechanistic or just a rodent model study. It doesn't pave the way for the rest of your life, but it gives you another nugget, another little tool in that toolbox to say, hey, how can I do this better? How can I grow versus react? Well, I, I, I like his approach and I can see why he's very popular for those who want scientific information about keto diets. There was one little thing in there that did you catch it where he, he said um, that everyone should eat carbs every every now and then. I, I'd like to learn more about that because I'm not sure if that was paying homage to someone or, or to carbs or, or whether there's actual science around that. I'm not sure that that's actually necessary. And a huge one, and one that I deal with all the time, whether it's special forces, whether it's military in general, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's just flat out CrossFit or people that are workout performance oriented, is going to be performance. They notice a decline in their performance over time. And there's a couple of things that go on. If you do not adhere to a strict ketogenic diet and you live in that gray area. So one moment to contextualize this. If you're a patient of mine, you might be coming to see me and you can't even get out of the wheelchair or, or your knee pain is so bad you're, you're going to lose weight so you can get a knee replacement. This doesn't apply to you at all. And it, it kind of a big take home point of a lot of the information on the internet, including the information here that Tom has, is that he's talking about a different population, not people in the clinic who are trying to reverse serious metabolic issues and, and often they can't do any exercise. And, and no, you don't have to exercise to lose weight. You can do it just by diet change. So a lot of the information here is really reserved for those who are trying to Remember Tom's background, he's a personal trainer, and, and so he's trying to treat, teach people who are really high functioning. That said, the, the, you want to do a keto diet in a medical clinic with someone who understands how to take away medications, and that is something I wouldn't ask Tom to do, and then asking him or asking me to treat one of his clients doing CrossFit, you wouldn't want me doing that because I don't know how to tailor the information to someone doing that or high performance. Although there are people who are winning records in record time by being fat burners, it may take time for you to totally keto adapt, it's called, or fat adapt. Of occasionally having a little bit of carbs, but you're not like full keto, that can mess you up. And that's simply because when your glycogen levels are, well not your glycogen, but your ketone levels are high enough for a long enough period of time, and you're actually getting yourself low carb enough, eventually your body will establish new ways to create carbohydrates and restore muscle glycogen. This takes time. It takes 90 days, sometimes more. And some of these longer studies demonstrate that this continues to change over the course of one and two years where the longer you are lower carb, the more efficient your body is at restoring glycogen from other substrates. So eventually you have just as much glycogen as you would otherwise. Which Yeah, so if you're wanting to learn more about athletic performance and low carb keto diets, I highly recommend two documentary films, one called Serial Killers, C-E-R-E-A-L, Killers and Serial Killers 2, where you're going to follow two people who keto adapt. It took them six months to fully burn fat at the maximal level. They, they waited until they got to their asymptote or the highest level that didn't change. Then they went into a rowboat and rowed from San Francisco to Hawaii and broke the world's record by 15 days. I mean, it, it, heroic, but it, what a wonderful film. You get to meet Steve Finney, who's one of my teachers. And if you have any question about how to fine-tune keto with athletic performance, 
I'm not the one to, to be the expert. I would refer you to people like Tom, people like Zach Bitter, who is the ultra marathon champion of the world. He is a low carb kind of guy. And there are people who actually will coach you in, in performance and keto at the same time means that you could do anaerobic activity just fine, but people don't go strict keto for a year or two. Candidly, I did, and I think it made a huge difference as to why I could perform at a high intensity in a ketogenic state. On the other side of the equation, people that do say, okay, I'm gonna have a little bit of carbs to fuel my workouts or post-workout to backload or whatever, they're not adding enough. They're putting themselves right back into metabolic purgatory in this like gray area of the body not knowing what to do. It's okay, if you're going to fuel for a workout, fuel appropriately, have 75 grams of carbs or something. Chances are you're athletic enough and you're moving enough to burn it and you're still gonna be in a ketogenic state. And let's abandon this whole keto fixation for a second. Are we trying to achieve ketones or are we trying to achieve optimal human performance and result? So low carb is your lifestyle and you periodize your carbohydrates around your workout. Then carb up appropriately and get that dang workout in and then go back to low carb after your workout window. It's plain and simple. So you don't need to be dogmatic with your approach to anti-keto just because you're no longer keto. You've learned something valuable and it's a new tool in your toolbox. I'll see you tomorrow. Remember, there are different populations of, of people and, and he's in his mid thirties. So always consider the source. Consider that if someone did this for their own personal benefit, why did they do it? If you're doing this to reverse diabetes or, or if you're doing this to reverse diabetes or other metabolic problem, don't pay attention to the details of, of what he's talking about. But it's a good exercise in learning which videos to, to listen to, which ones to not listen to. And if you're uh, trying to ultimately improve your metabolic performance, there are other resources that those videos that I mentioned, Serial Killers, Serial Killers 2. There also are books by Steve Finney and Jeff Volek, The Art and Science of Low Carbohydrate Performance is an excellent book. And then follow the research by Jeff Volek, V-O-L-E-K, and Professor Tim Noakes, N-O-A-K-E-S. I hope that's helpful. And if you've liked this, please like, please subscribe so you don't miss out on further content. Ring the notification bell. If you don't have my top 10 tips on how to start keto right, please look in the description below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, and check out adapterlifeacademy.com.